Well, hey, good morning, Connection Point. Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand together and declare these truths about our God over our lives. Come on, with one voice we sing. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. That's why we're here today. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. And I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna say, Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roll up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Cause death is defeated. The king is.
y'all but I'm thankful for a God whose love continues to run whether it's we feel out of breath singing the song or we feel out of breath the way we walked in in life this morning and I just wanted to pose the question to each of us today to us when's the last time you truly let the love of God overwhelm you maybe it's been a while maybe it's right here right now uh, for me it was as I was preparing to get ready for this new song that we're going to sing together um but that's why we take communion, to remember, and to anchor ourselves in the person and the work of Jesus uh, each, each week. And so would you take out your elements as we remember that Jesus has made us for more um, than striving. He's made us for more than performance. He's made us more for more um, than what we can see with our own eyes that he's made us 
for himself. And C.S. Lewis says, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. And so would you go ahead and take the bread? On the night he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples, this bread represents my body broken for you. Let's take and eat together. And then he continued and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Let's take and drink together. Jesus, we give you praise for the fact that you've made us for yourself first and foremost. So we surrender to you today. Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the start And now I am chosen Free and forgiven I have a future that's worth the living Cause I wasn't Cause I wasn't made to be Tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again And I was made for more yeah. So why would I make A bed in my shame way fountain of grace is running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more do you believe that today church
Sing that over your life today. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours, and I was made for more. Come on, church, let's give him praise for that today. Through Jesus Christ, we've been made for more. We've been set free to live in newness together. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. Check out this video. Happy Mother's Day weekend to all our moms, grandmas, aunts, and mom-like figures. From one mom to another, we are so glad you're here, and we hope that today we make you feel loved and welcomed. You may notice behind me the rendering of our future remodeled Carmel location. Last May, God miraculously allowed us to secure this property and raise funds to do a full interior and exterior renovation. Part of our vision here at Connection Point is to raise the strongest generation, believing that today's kids and students will become tomorrow's Christ-centered leaders. We want our kids to understand their identity in Christ, that the Bible is their source of truth, and that their strongest friendships and relationships are with other followers of Jesus. As we continue to grow in our reach in areas like Carmel through this future location, we are excited to celebrate the past and bring new life into these classrooms. A great example of this is Liz, a single mom who's been attending the Brownsburg location with her daughter, Grace. Liz lives on the north side and has stepped out to be part of the Carmel Go team. I had the blessing during some of our early clean out and demolition to see Liz and her daughter Grace cleaning out and demoing the very kids rooms that Grace would soon be setting in as part of the Carmel team. Grace will form Christ-centered friendships in the community that she goes to school, that she plays sports and that she lives in. As Liz and Grace prepare for our Carmel launch, they've stepped out in faith in this season to help Fisher's launch and are serving in the kids area. Liz and Grace are just one example of the hundreds of families that God will allow us to reach through our future Carmel location. Thank you to each of you through the Our Calling campaign that are making this Carmel construction process possible. Your generosity is changing lives all across central Indiana. Now let's prepare our hearts for the Word of God as we continue in our series, Satisfied. to the mothers and all the women who've cared for us, to the grandmothers, the spiritual mothers, and the waiting mothers, to the foster moms, the single moms, and the stepmoms, to the mentors, friends, guardians, and guides, to those who loved us, taught us, and showed us the way, to those who carried us, held our hand, and watched us grow, to those who experienced blessing this year, and to those who went through loss, to the heroic women all around us, we want to say thank you. Thank you for your courage, your kindness, and your faith in God. Thank you for shaping us, nurturing us, and walking with us through life. Thank you for showing us what it looks like to love and follow Jesus. Thank you for your prayers, your wisdom, and for never giving up on us. Thank you for boldly stepping into this high and holy calling. Thank you for the long nights and the short years and for the incredible joy. Whether this is a day of reflection, rejoicing, or remembering, we acknowledge you, we honor you, and we thank you today. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, let's honor, honor our moms. We love you, moms. Thank you for putting up with us for so many years. 
<laughs> and uh, hey, whether you're over at Fishers or Avon, maybe you're here at Brownsburg in one of our overflow rooms or online with us, I'm just so glad you're in this moment. And uh, I really believe God has a word for you, whether you're a mom, a spiritual mother, or uh, like me, those don't apply, but God's got a word for you today. Uh, mothering is, is such a roller coaster of highs and lows, my wife Mel tells me. And uh, it's full of these precious moments. Uh, check out this precious moment of first word of a baby saying mama. Go ahead and take a look. Can you say mama? Mama. Oh. <laughs> Did you say mama? No. Mama. Ellie, can you say dada? No. <gasps> Yeah, it's a beautiful journey, but it's also full of moments uh, like this. Here's a picture from my childhood. And uh, if you really study this picture, I mean, think about this. Mom and dad worked hard. I'm the youngest of four boys to get all the boys in the old Chevrolet station wagon, which was rusted out, to drive somewhere where there's a lake and to get all the kids out there. And probably everyone's having a good time except for little baby John. And as a result, you can just imagine for my mom, I mean, look at her. She's like smiling like she's having a good time. But we all know what it's like to have a crying baby around. And that's part of motherhood as well. I I was a difficult child. And I don't just mean that in like a self-deprecating way. I I really was. I was sick a lot as a kid. I had this uh, disease called Kawasaki disease when I was a toddler. I was supposed to die. My mom wept over me, prayed over me, had all her friends at church pray, uh, and God healed me from that. Uh, but then throughout life, I mean, I was just a stubborn, strong willed kid. And my poor parents, I mean, every school teacher, I was the problem kid. I remember times the church they took me to where the Sunday school teacher came to our house in tears for me to apologize for how much I had disrupted Sunday school. I was just that kid. And and of course, you know, it got even worse as a teenager. I was just a strong-willed kid who had to make a lot of the mistakes for myself and make the stupid choices for myself. Somehow my mom kept praying patiently for me through all of that. I don't know if you can relate to that fear or that feeling of having someone you love and they're just running their life in the wrong direction. And it's not that you're trying to be controlling, you're not trying to manage them, you're not trying to, you know, pick every decision in their life. You're just trying to get them on a track where they're making good decisions because you can see the road that they're on. Uh, My parents were there, and I know that they just prayed for me faithfully day in, day out. Now, whether you're a parent, or maybe you're a sibling of someone like that, or maybe it's someone uh, you played sports with, or a classmate, or a roommate, that you just see them on this path that isn't good, here's the question we're going to ask in our time today. How can you best influence the people you love toward good choices? I mean, we can't control them, right? Everyone has a free will. You can be a perfect parent and have an imperfect kid because guess what? We're all sinners. We're all going to mess up. So if you can't control the choices of the people you love, you can't always keep them safe and guarded, then what can you do to help shape them, to have an influence that, that, that maybe steers them toward making better choices, maybe steers them toward things of freedom rather than of addiction, Uh, that steers them ultimately toward God and the fulfillment that's only found in him. In fact, I wonder right now, uh, wherever you are, if you would just think of one person in your life who you really care about, you just want the best for them. And if God could use you to somehow be an influence on them that, that leads them in a better direction in life, just picture the face of that person or think of the name of that person. That's what we're talking about in our time today. Uh, Here's another angle at this same question. When you get to the end of your life and you look back, what can you do right now? What can you do today, this month, this year, to ensure that when you're at the very end of your life, hopefully as you're taking those final breaths, you're surrounded by loved ones, and hopefully you're not weighed down by a cloud of regret of, oh my goodness, I just wish I had used my time to spend more time with the people I love or to, to better guide them in their life. 
Well, God talks about these tensions that we all experience. We've been studying this book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. And if you think churchy people are just fake and always pretending, you've got to read Ecclesiastes. I mean, this book just tells life how it is. It's incredibly gritty. It's incredibly raw and honest. And in chapter 3, it says this, For everything, there's a season. There's a time for every activity under the sun. There's a time to be born. And we don't like to think about it, but there is a time to die. Last weekend here at our Brownsburg location, we got to celebrate new life with child and family dedications. I love these Sundays. It's so fun because the heart of our calling as a church is to raise sons and daughters to grow up to be men and women of God and to know God in a rapidly changing world and to live lives of hope and peace in a world that is desperate for both. Every one of these kids on stage at both of our services It's just a miracle answer to prayer. But think about this. None of us picked the time we were born, right? Did any of those babies or any of those kids were like, you know, I'm going to be born in 2024. None of us picked the time. Now, some of you, you were super stubborn and, and you maybe your birth came a few days late because you were just stubborn. But what I mean is you don't get to pick the decade, You don't get to pick the era into which you're born. You don't even get to pick the family into which you're born. And equally, Ecclesiastes tells us, none of us can prevent the time when we'll die. I mean, just as powerless as you and I were to decide when and where we'd be born, we're just as powerless to extend our life beyond our final breath. The great boxer Muhammad Ali is famous for his quote of saying, I am the greatest. And for about 10 years, he was the greatest at one thing in the world for about 10 years. Not long after that, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's in that body that his ego put so much confidence in started to shudder and shake until in June of 2016, The man who said and truly believed, I'm the greatest of all time, breathed his final breath in Scottsdale, Arizona, and passed away at the age of 74. Ecclesiastes is a kind of bucket of cold water in the face about life. It it makes us stand back and evaluate our life, that our life is short. None of us pick the time we're born. Equally, none of us get to prevent the time then we'll die. So... What can you do in the middle? And that's what Solomon, who was a billionaire inheritor, this guy had massive wealth. He tasted every pleasure. He built every palace project you could. He did everything. And in these 12 chapters, he writes this kind of life journal. And he says, hey, a lot of you, even if you pursue pleasure all out, you won't even get to do some of the stuff that I did. And let me just tell you how empty it all was got to find some meaning in life. That's what this book is about. And the answer to that question is right here in Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant. And then there's a time to harvest. Now, in the Hebrew language, they love doing these parallels. So planting is something to do after you're born. And while a harvest can occur in your lifetime, the greatest harvest will occur at your, at your funeral. When you're gone from this life into the next life and all the fruit of what you invested in is fully exposed. This is God's answer to these questions we deal with. How can I best lead the people I love? And what can I do to make sure I don't have big regrets at the end of my life? Here's the big idea. Plant as many seeds as you can while you still can. Plant as many seeds as you can while you still can. Now, this isn't talking about literal seeds. So if you're a farmer, go for it. That's great. This is talking about this reality that those cute kids on stage from last week will blink, and before we know it, they'll be 16. And then they'll be 26, and they'll be up here with their kids. Moms, dads, if you want to plant virtuous values and beliefs that will protect those little ones from the multiplying dangers of our world, now's the time to do it. 
death also waits for no one. So if you want to plant seeds in relationships and life change and eternal things that will outlive you so that at the end of your life, it's not just, you know, uh, a, a physical existence, but there's a legacy that changed people, now's the time to do it. Plant as many seeds as you can while you still can. Because just as you didn't get to pick when you were born, death will creep up on you. And now is the time to plant so that you can have a great harvest. Now, last week we looked at a story of Jesus and we learned that in scripture, when God talks about planting seeds, the seed is the word of God. It doesn't mean we like take Bibles and go plant them in the ground (laughs) because the soil is the hearts of people. And so the idea is getting the truths of God into the minds and the hearts of people. That's what planting is all about. And ultimately, this whole book, the Bible, can be summarized with this term, the good news, or maybe you've heard people call it the gospel. And what that is, is this message that though you're a sinner, we all are, there's a God who loves you, the one true God who made you. And he came into our world in the person of Jesus. He willingly took our consequences upon himself when he died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And now salvation is freely available to anyone who will just be humble enough to say, God, I need your help. God, will you forgive me? That's the good news. And all of this big book is really about that. So that's the seed that we're trying to plant into the hearts and minds of people. And as you go about doing that, you become, in God's language, the farmer or the sower. You're planting these seeds and we learned last week that the, whether a person gets changed or not doesn't depend on the word of God. It will always do its part. But it depends on the condition of our heart. Jesus described some people who are hard-hearted, which was me for too much of my life. And when you're hard-hearted, the seed of God's truth sits on top of the soil just like it would on a concrete sidewalk. And it doesn't get absorbed, and no roots go down, and it makes no difference. And then we looked at some other soils, and then there's this ideal soil that is a receptive heart. It's what you see right now when the big tractors are pulling these giant mechanisms called a seed cultivator. And what they're doing is they're digging up the soil, which has gotten hard over the winter, and now they're softening it by turning it over. And you can, even right now, you can say to God, God, give me a tender or a receptive heart. Give me good soil for my heart. What we learned last week is that a receptive heart, when you plant God's word into a receptive heart, it will lead to a fruitful life, which ultimately leads to a fulfilling life. And even if you're here and you don't yet believe in God, You can start praying the way that I used to pray when I didn't believe in God. I'd say, God, if you're there, here's my prayer. And if you're not, I don't want to waste my time. So if you are, would you please reveal yourself to me? But God, if you're there, would you give me a tender heart to receive your good news so that I can live the fruitful and fulfilling life that you designed me for? Now, last week, we learned this principle primarily as a personal application. Do you want to be fruitful and fulfilled? Choose a tender heart toward God and sprinkle as many seeds of God's word into your mind as you can. So be in a Bible teaching church on weekends. Be listening to music, not the only music you listen to, but listen to some music that has, you know, biblical lyrics. And be around people who talk about it. doesn't mean you have to become some religious, churchy, whatever. But you're filling your mind and you're filling your friendships with other people who are filling their minds with the word of God. So last week was really, hey, apply this for yourself so that you can live the fruitful, fulfilled life that God wants for you. This week we're looking at the same principle, but we're turning it outward. To say, how can you best influence the people you love toward what is in their best interest? Well, sprinkle the word of God into their lives. Plant as many seeds of scripture as you can. And then model for them, here's what a tender heart looks like. And ultimately pray for them that God will soften their heart. 
this is what my parents did right when they had this really strong-willed, stubborn, independent teenager and young adult who, I mean, I turned seven, well, I was 17 when I finished high school and I just left. I like moved to a different state. I just went my own way. But they kept praying for me every day. And as I went out as a journalist and saw how the world worked, interviewing everyone from heroin addicts to NFL athletes, billionaires, to immigrants coming across the border from Mexico into Arizona, I saw the whole strata of humanity and all these Bible truths that I'd been taught by those poor Sunday school teachers who put up with me started to echo in my mind. Oh my goodness, everyone is a sinner. You can pretty much predict what people will do. They're all selfish. Humanity is broken. Even if we get a law changed, lobbyists come in and change it back. Like, what's the hope of the world? And all these truths, that these seeds that had been planted those first 17 years of my life, they were still in there. So parents... We can do that, especially when your kids are little. You've got more opportunity than ever. But also, parents and every one of us who loves someone, model, here's what a tender heart looks like. In other words, here's what a submitted, surrendered life looks like. Our life isn't just all about how much wealth can we stock up. It's not just about how nice of vacations can we take. It's not just about our retirement. Our life, we're laying down to serve others just as Jesus did. Your kids will catch that a lot more than anything you say. They're just going to see it from your example. And what my parents, they lived that out as well. But then when my heart was hard, they planted all those seeds, but my heart was hard, but they prayed for me. I saw this in high school. I would wake up and my mom and dad would be at our uh, kind of kitchen island, sitting there together with a Bible open and very often, as I was on my way out the door to school, they, they would be praying. And I knew they were praying for me. I knew they were praying that God would soften my heart. And I, I even laughed at that at times and mocked that at times. But God answered those prayers and he softened the soil of my heart. And those seeds took root. And it has led me to a life of fulfillment and meaning and purpose and peace that I absolutely couldn't find anywhere else. So never give up on your loved ones. Scatter as much scripture as you can. The younger they are, the easier that is to do. Model for them a life of surrender. Pray that the soil of their heart would be soft and receptive. What does this look like? Well, it looks like faces. Here's one example. We're a movement of thousands of people, and we could show you thousands of faces, but I want to tell you about one specific family. And this family would be the first to tell you that they're not really any different from you or me. They're not perfect. They're not overly religious. But as they have been good soil, that is, they've received the word of God week in and week out, and they've obeyed it day in and day out, God has multiplied a harvest through them. It's what Jesus talked about in Mark 4. Here's the ideal state of your heart and mine. He said, other people... They're like seeds sown on good soil. Their heart is receptive. They hear the word of God, the good news of Jesus. They accept it. Meaning, if I was planning to go this way, and I learned that God says to go this way, I adjust course. And as they adjust their course, not perfectly, but consistently, to live out what God says, they start to change. And there's a, a produce within them. It produces fruits like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. I mean, imagine your household. If everyone in your house every day was full of love, joy, peace, patience, I mean, just this morning while you were getting ready, imagine if that had been the case, right? So as we start to uh, get the Word of God in us, surrender to the Word of God, the new life of Christ within us, we're not just trying to be better people. There's a supernatural thing that starts to happen in us when we're born again. There's a new life in us. We surrender to that new life. It starts to produce good fruit. And as that fruit continues, it starts to plant and reach other people. Sometimes a Christian in their lifetime will reach 30 people. Sometimes they'll reach 60 people. Sometimes they'll reach 100. By the way, if you're faithfully serving and giving and praying, you don't even know how many you've reached until you get you know, to the other side, to the next life, and they all line up to thank you. Let me show you this true story of what happens in good soil 
where the seed of God's word multiplies. So this story starts in July of 2008 with a young married couple, Doug and Dodie. Doug and Dodie. They get married. They start thinking, you know, we want to have kids. We should probably get back to church. We need to find a good church so that our kids can grow up and have some kind of moral compass. So they went church shopping and uh, Connection Point happened to be the first church they visited. They visited on a weekend uh, where the series was called Fireproofing Your Marriage. They had just gotten married. It was a perfect fit. What did they do? They received the word of God. Then they applied it to their lives. They started to see, wow, this stuff helps our marriage. Then they learned about a financial coaching course called Financial Peace. They said, hey, uh, we're just getting started in our careers. Let's, let's put our finances under God from the start. And they did. And they started to see the fruit from that. Well, pretty soon they invited each of their sets of parents who all live here in Indiana. Soon Doug's parents and Dodie's parents started attending with them. Uh, Dodie had never been baptized. Doug had walked away from his faith for a little bit in college. So in 2009, they got baptized together. Then they learned this principle that's true for all of us. If you really want to have a consistent spiritual life, you got to get some close friends who are also believers. So they joined a small group, which uh, we can help you do today if you want to be in a small group. And that's just you having other people who are praying with you and they're helping you grow in Christ. And that ended up being a real big gift for Doug and Dodie because as they tried to start their family, they battled with infertility. Uh, if you've ever been through that, it's incredibly emotional when the desire of your heart is to start a family and you're just not able to. From 2009 to 2013, Dodie underwent countless procedures, surgeries, uh, IVF rounds, and their small group here from Connection Point was around them through that entire emotional journey. Well, in 2013, as a miracle answer to prayer, their twins were born, Charlie and Harrison, and they got to dedicate them right here on this stage, just like the parents did last week, but this was back in 2013. Then in August of 2017, Everly was born, and they were able to dedicate her to the Lord as well. Well, pretty soon, you know, the family's growing, the careers are growing. They have the opportunity to build a house. They look at the Indianapolis metro area, could really pick anywhere. They said, we want to build a house right near Connection Point because we just love the church and how much it helps us. So they built their house right around the corner here. And then as they really became more and more part of the Brownsburg community, they just started meeting friends like at local gyms and other places and inviting those friends to just, hey, you know, come to church with us and just hear about God and how he can help you. And so uh, Dodie's friend, Julie, starts to attend, as well as one of her other friends. And then Julie's husband, Scott, starts having these conversations with Doug about God. I mean, this is just real life stuff, right? Like having a barbecue or being at the kids' soccer games. And just here's the reality of what God has done in our lives. Well, Julie and Scott started attending Connection Point there in 2021. Then some of Julie and Scott's siblings and parents began attending. Uh, and then, you know, I mean, the list just goes on. Uh, there's people from uh, out of Indianapolis who watch online through these families. Uh, there are nieces and nephews. Let's move up to August of 2023. So nine months ago, Harrison, that miracle baby, was attending our summer camp, Camp Allendale. And because of a connection point person who was there serving as a camp counselor, Harrison made the decision to place his faith in Jesus and then to be baptized this last August. He was surrounded by family and friends, all these other families that had just kind of one by one started attending the church. His cousins were there. I just, I, I love this moment. I'll try to describe it that, you know, Doug, the dad, baptizes Harrison. And then Julie, the friend from Dodie's gym, her cousin Sarah gets baptized. And then people are turning around baptizing other people. This leads up to January of this year. So four months ago, Charlie Kleiss, the other of those twins, was baptized. And then Scott Morgan, the husband of Julie, the friend from the gym, 
He gets baptized by Ron Merrill, our teaching pastor. Scott then turns around and baptizes his son Noah. Julie's sister-in-law gets baptized. And then she baptizes her son Landon. I mean, it just keeps multiplying. And and no one's being overly religious or overly churchy. Just living an authentic Jesus life leads up to a co-worker of Doug's named Damon. Uh, Doug invited him to attend Christmas Eve service here. And he attended in 2021. And then for a year, nothing. But then he attended in 2022. And then he attended Christmas a year later in 2023. Now, Damon is attending our Avon location week in and week out. And he's actually part of a men's Bible study over there. And the point is this, what does the good soil do? It receives the word of God. It just puts it into practice in normal life. And as Jesus said, then that multiplies. And we could tell that story with many, many families here. So think about this, go back to 15 years ago, one sincere couple who'd be the first to tell you they're not perfect, but with tender hearts toward God, just said, we're going to be consistent in the house of God, and we're going to consistently obey the word of God, and then boom, look at the harvest in just 15 years from one couple. Uh, Can we give God the glory that it's the power of his word that does that? God gets the credit, and here's the thing, uh, any one of us can be that soil. The power is in the word of God. All it needs is a surrendered, uh, obedient heart. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to every one of you who serve here, who give here, who pray. Because this whole uh, collage of changed lives, it would not exist if this building were not here. And many of you funded this building. It would not exist if regular giving that keeps the lights on and the ministries going wasn't in place. It wouldn't exist if those of you who serve as greeters, those of you who serve in our kids' areas, those of you who serve behind the scenes, if you all hadn't been serving, this fruit is really on all of our hands for all of you who are regularly a part of what God is doing here. You position your loved ones for fulfilling life and for eternal life when you consistently expose them to God's word while modeling a tender, submitted heart. That's something every single one of us can do no matter what stage of life we're in. I want you to envision the end of your life on earth. I know it's not a pleasant thought. But it'll happen. We'll all have that moment where we're hopefully laying in a comfortable bed somewhere and we're taking our final breaths. Hopefully we're surrounded by people we love and we invested our life in. You know, no one in those moments says like, stack up all the gold bars next to me. Good thing I own 10 homes right now. It doesn't matter. You can only sleep in one. You can only die in one. In that moment, and I saw this as a journalist. I've seen it as a pastor. People want people around them. And it's not uncommon that people regret, I wish I had invested more in these relationships. But I want you to envision the end of your life in that moment. You have a no regrets legacy. You look back on your life and you're like, you know what? Because the word of God taught me what to do and I followed it consistently. My life was not wasted. I've invested it in what matters and I'm surrounded by people I love. And I know that as I go into eternity... Through my relationship with Jesus, I know where I'm going, but I also know that there's going to be great reward there, that things I planted in my time on earth are going to bear fruit that is actually eternal. Well, how can you do this? Maybe you want to snap pictures of these. I'm just going to fly through these. There's hundreds of ways. How do you get God's word into the hearts of the people you love? Well, step one, just bring them to church every week, even if they're the kid that's making the Sunday school teacher cry. Keep bringing them back. Good for them. We want them here. We want you here. Speak God's word over them. And and parents, I'm telling you, especially from birth to age 12, um, you have such a window of opportunity that closes. Um, Keep bringing them here when they're a teenager, but they're going to start to have an opinion about it. Now, thankfully, we've got amazing middle and high school ministries that our teenagers love, but don't miss those first 12 years. Speak God's word over them. And if they're in a place where their heart is hard and they don't want a Bible verse, 
just kind of paraphrase it and don't give them the reference. They won't know the better, right? Like, hey, you know, you know what? Maybe just try to trust in God and lean not on your own understanding. Like, really, really just lay your plans out before him, right? I just Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you, and you didn't even know it. <laughs> so the more the word of God is in your mind, you know, the more you can speak it into the lives of the people you love. You can post it in your home. You can play it in good music. Now, I'll be honest, I'm really picky about music. Some Christian music's terribly corny. But you can find some to at least supplement into your music, um, you know, your musical style. You can find some that get you some words and ideas that are pointing you towards God and towards the Bible. And then, of course, you can read the Bible together. We love giving away these $45 life application study Bibles. We'll give you one for free if you want to use it, and we'll teach you how to use it so that you can read the word of God for yourself. And you can do this as a family. This doesn't have to be like an hour. It could be that you're at dinner and for just five minutes, you read a verse and you guys talk about it as a family. How do you model a tender heart toward God? Because the soil needs to be good. Will show your loved ones that you sacrifice your interests to put God first. Uh, Your kids know what you value more than you do. My kids know how much I value cars. They just do. They also know that there are cars I've passed up so that we can do ministry. They know that. They know that there's vacations we've passed up. And, and that, that's true across this movement for so many of you. But let your kids see that. Let them see that you make sacrifices in your schedule to be a part of the movement of God. Uh, they're going to see where you put your treasure and your time is ultimately what you value the most. So Uh, Sports are great. I'm loving watching the Pacers right now. Let's be praying for them. They play at 3.30 today in the NBA Finals. Travel sports are great. There's nothing wrong with it. But if your actual values are sports first, God second, your kids are going to see that. And they're going to absorb that. And there's just, there's ways that you can be fully engaged. We've got families in our church engaged in athletics at the highest levels, but their kids still know it's God first. Show them that you put God first with your time. Show them that you put God first with your money. And and that's what modeling a tender heart looks like. You don't have to be perfect to model a tender heart. This is just an important point. You don't have to be perfect. You might be listening to this and just thinking, oh, John, if you knew how much I fall short, if you knew the things I struggle with in my inner life, if you knew the way I sometimes lose my temper, I don't think it's even worth a try. It's totally worth a try. Here's why. Think about farming. Think about when, you know, it's harvest time and you see a field of corn and they're like, you know, eight, nine foot tall corn. It's like they keep getting taller, you know. Did that farmer have to be a perfect person? No, he could be a pretty messed up dude. But if he tills the soil and if he plants the seeds, he's going to get a harvest. This is one of the really fascinating things about scripture. It's a lot more like that than you might think. It's not about you being perfect. Now, hopefully you're modeling that tender soil. But what really matters is, are you planting the seeds? And are you praying that God will give your loved ones tender hearts toward him? You don't have to be overly religious to plant these seeds of God's word. Solomon, who wrote this book of Ecclesiastes, if you read the whole thing for yourself, it's a pretty fun read because he was not a perfect guy. He did some pretty broken things, and yet God used him. Why? He planted seeds and he had a tender heart toward God. Galatians 6 says this, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest. How will you reap a harvest? If you don't give up. Now, if you get the, you know, the field half planted and you give up, you're going to get half of a harvest. Keep planting even when you don't see the fruit. That story I showed you with Doug and Dodie, that's pretty cool. In 15 years, you can see all the fruit. Sometimes you don't see it till the end of your life. Sometimes there's a mother or father of a a wayward son or daughter who goes away from God, away from truth, away from morality, and, and they just keep praying. And it's not until their funeral that that son or daughter comes back to God, but God brings them back. Like, just keep planting the seeds. Keep doing what you can do. At the end of his life, this billionaire playboy, Solomon, he writes this, Ecclesiastes, there's 12 short chapters. It's essentially his journal about seeking fulfillment and pleasure in life. And when he reaches the conclusion, he says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. 
Youth is exciting. And I love this time of year. We've got high school graduations. We've got college graduations. We've got weddings. We've got babies being born. Like youth is amazing. And we've learned in Solomon's letter here, enjoy it. Savor it. Because someday you'll be old. Like live it up. The Bible says that. But as you live it up, don't forget there's someone who made you who you'll answer to. And choose to honor him in your youth. Think of Doug and Dodie. Right after they got married, they said, let's go find a church. That changed their lives. When you're in your 20s, you are at a fork in the road of the direction of your life. And if you decide, I'm just going to drink a little more, a little more, a little more, and then try something else. Like, you just picked a whole direction for your life. Or you say, you know what? I'm going to find a church where I fit, where I belong, where I hear the word of God. And though I'm not perfect, I'm, going to, I'm just going to go there and I'm going to do my best to live it out. It will change your life. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life's not pleasant anymore. That day's coming for all of us. Remember God before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dimmed. He's describing your eyes start to fail. Remember him before your legs start to tremble. Before your shoulders start to stoop. Remember God before your teeth stop being able to chew. Before your eyes see dimly. Remember God before the door to life's opportunities is closed. Think about this. Every single one of us, there's a door of life's opportunities and every day it closes a little bit. Whether you're 70 or 7 years old. The door of life is slowly closing. Some of you, it's like, yeah, I can just barely see a crack left in it. And some of you, you're young, and it looks like the door's wide open. But it's actually closing a little bit every day. I love watching the NBA, and I love these commentators on TNT. You've got Shaquille O'Neal on the left, one of the all-time greats. you got Charles Barkley on the right, and their little rants and debates are, are so fun to listen to. Uh, to the left of Charles Barkley, there is a guy named Kenny the Jet Smith, incredible athlete in his day. This happened about two weeks ago. Um, they're all ranting and raving, and Kenny the Jet Smith goes back to their big LED wall, and he's hopping up these steps, and he trips. He trips and falls, and they made a meme out of it, and it's all kind of funny and joking. But think about this. This guy 30 years ago was in the top half of 1% of top athletes in the world. And in 30 years, what happens? He's trying to go up the steps and he trips. I think God brought some of us here today to hear this, the door to life's opportunity. It is closing, but it's still open now. There's choices you can make. Scripture says it's appointed unto humans once to die, and after that, the judgment. Now, after you die, the first judgment is, did you believe in Jesus or not? Have you placed your faith in him? If so, you're welcomed into the family of God, the kingdom of God. Then for those of us who believe, there is a second judgment. And the second judgment is not for your salvation, but it's this. What did you do with what I gave to you? I gave you significant wealth, or I gave you significant talent, or I gave you significant health, or significant time on earth. What did you do with it? If you're alive today... It's still planting time. Now, I want to show you the story behind the story because I showed you Doug and Dodie and their life and how God has changed them and how that has reached many others for Christ. But Doug was raised in a Christian home where the word of God was planted like a seed, where the parents modeled a surrendered life and where they prayed for him. So I want you to see that that whole story is actually the harvest of another story. Take a look. We both grew up at East 38th Street Christian Church here in Indianapolis. And actually that is where we met, was at church youth group on a Sunday night. We were in different areas. She went to Arlington High School, I went to Lawrence Central High School. So we wouldn't have met each other had it not been for church. Both of my parents volunteered at church. And um, I started doing that myself with, with the youth group that I became involved in. And I think that was the gift that I was given. Um, I like to serve. It gives me a good feeling inside. And I think that that was part of the seed. 
Our youth group leaders were really great people, the Bonowitzes and the Scots, um, just really good people to help us. As I'm heading off, I ended up debating do I want to be in a ministry or other things, and my SAT scores came back. I said, okay, God, you gave me certain skills, and I ended up at Purdue in engineering because the dorms were full, and I ended up in a uh, house called Fairway Co-op, 40 guys, all Christians, and that's what it was based on, and that was the men that I lived with. So those guys also were part of the seeds of my life because we, today, still all of us are supportive of each other. We fast forwarded a few years and now we're in Northwest Indiana. The church became very comfortable, a second home. And so it was easy to acclimate the kids into that environment. And I remember so clearly when they were babies, we did a uh, baby dedication. And I just remember the, the commitment and the promise that we were going to raise our children to know Jesus. And uh, that was something we took very seriously. My two sons and I, and it was at my, my youngest son's emphasis, we ended up going on a mission trip to Guatemala. And that was just a wonderful experience to see my, my two sons, not as my sons, but as these men who were reaching out to other families and to other people. And I just kind of sat back and watched a little bit. It was a wonderful thing to see that. We have a family that's a good friend of ours that we just, we were on a, an outing and uh, started talking about this church as a great place to worship. And because uh, they were looking and I said, you know, it's a great place to really worship, to worship Jesus, to bring your family to and everything else. And they ended up coming here to a service and uh, it just so had, they didn't tell us ahead of time they were coming, but they ended up sitting right across the aisle from us, which, you know, the size of the church for them to have been on the same service and sitting across the aisle was amazing. And they've been coming ever since, fully plugged in. They, they have their own ministry and their own seeds they plant. And, and they're amazing people. I think what's really neat now is also to see our grandchildren come to faith and starting to be baptized. So we have six grandkids, so from there we've had three of those who have been baptized. So just great to see that next generation of, of the family kind of coming along. It's amazing to see all of that happen. Just watching our kids and their interaction with our grandkids, um, how they teach them, it's just been amazing to watch. It's so much fun to see them have an outreach, um, them bringing their friends to, to come to church to know Christ, um, and even to where they're getting their children are getting active in the ministry, how they have started to plant seeds and those seeds are growing too. Yeah, praise God. He works through surrendered people. That's all it takes. Show up, be surrendered. Keep getting the word of God in your heart. If you're a young person, I hope you'll let that story be a North Star for you, especially young couples. Keep being in a Bible-centered church. Keep surrendering to the word of God. It absolutely will create a legacy, a fruitful, fulfilled life. Some of that we get to see here. But there's way more people impacted than we could put on a screen that we'll see when we get to eternal life. I know for others of you, you watch that and you think, I wish I could go back and do it over. If that's you, I just want to encourage you, the door to life's opportunity is still open. And you can take every day you have from now until you see God face to face to plant as much of God's word as you can. You can support ministries that plant the word of God. You can use the time you have left, use the health you have left, use the relationships you still have. Uh, the game is not over. The door is still open. Ecclesiastes 3, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant. God wants us to know today it's planting time. Let me pray that for you. Father, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would just do your work in every one of our hearts. I pray for the person who's been resisting you and knew as we're talking about that hard-hearted soil, they know that's them. I remember when that was me. Pray that even now you'd soften the soil of their heart, that they would receive the good news of hope in Jesus, life in Jesus, freedom in Jesus. 
God, we pray for our young people growing up at every location here in every family. We pray that you would give them tender hearts toward you. And I pray for every mom and dad and grandparent. And I pray for every kingdom worker here, every volunteer at every location that we would model for them. Here's what a life of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness looks like. Here's what a life of kindness and self-control is like. Here's what it looks like to sacrifice our time for the kingdom of God, our treasure for the kingdom of God. And we pray, Lord, that our young people growing up now, that you'd capture their hearts, that you'd protect them from evil, Lord, in a world of just so much hatred and division, make them agents of peace and hope and send them out supernaturally to change this world for you. God, I pray for the person who watched that video, saw that story, and really truly feels like, I wish I could go back and do it over. I pray that they would know that you are a God of second chances and that they are alive today for a reason. The door of opportunity has not yet closed. I pray that every single one of us, Lord, that we'd go all in for you, all in for the next generation, all in planting the seeds of your word with our time, with our treasure, with what you've given us. We love you, Jesus. We pray it all in your name, amen. Thank you, John, very much. And before we go, let's celebrate some of the best, best planters we know. That's our moms in, the, in this house. Come on, let's celebrate them today. We're thank you. Give them a high five, a hug, something to let them know you love them. And we do have a flower bar in the lobby. We have photo opportunities. Take advantage of those before you go today. If you are new, make sure you get a gift on your way out at our Connection Corner. We'll see you back here for Satisfied next week. Have a great day.